Atheist Nomads, episode 99, Humanist Disaster Recovery with Rebecca Witzman. Atheist Nomads is proudly brought to you by Archway Hosting. Check out their low-price, full-featured hosting solutions at archwayhosting.com. That's A-R-C-H-W-A-Y hosting.com. Hey, we're also brought to you by listeners just like you. Find out how you can become a patron at patreon.com forward slash atheist nomads. That's P A T R E O N dot com forward slash atheist nomads. As a concerned parent of the uh, free thought community, I want to advise uh, Atheist Nomad listeners that this is an adult show. There will be things discussed, talked about, topics that may be inappropriate for children under the age of 25, 26, 27, 40. (laughs) We are the Atheist Nomads bringing you history, science, politics, religion, and interviews with leaders in the atheist community. Not all those who wander are lost. Welcome to another episode of Atheist Nomads. This is episode number 99. I am Dustin. Joining me as always is Wesley. 99 with a bullet. And joining us once again is Rebecca Witzman. Uh, we talked to her in August 2013 in episode 33 about her home being destroyed by a tornado and for telling Wolf Blitzer that she was actually an atheist on live TV. Yeah, Rebecca, she told Wolf to fuck off. That's yeah. what I said, exactly, word for word. <laughs> <laughs> Rebecca is now the Humanist uh, Disaster Recovery Team's Development Coordinator at the Foundation of Belief, and they have officially launched this new program. Rebecca, welcome back to Atheist Nomads. Hi! Thanks for having me. Yay! Yay! Yeah. <laughs> so uh, yes, let's. I like that. I'm. I'm. I, I get to show up on multiples of thirty-three. That's... Oh, nice! Nice. Uh, yeah. Nobody else can claim that. That's right. <laughs> yeah. We, we totally play on that. I just want you to know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I know. Yeah, totally. Yeah. <laughs> perfect. I'm impressed. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so let's let's uh, start off with the the uh, disaster recovery team. So what's what's this program uh, looking like now? Um, well, we are currently um, in the final stages of editing uh, three separate trainings, and as soon as that's complete, uh, we will basically be set to launch to. Um, whatever disaster uh, might need us. So that that's going to, the we're looking to completely finish the uh, final editing process this June. So next month. And nice. so July, August, September, whenever something happens um, after that point. Okay. And awesome. So, so you're looking at a team that's going to be able to travel nationwide or is this uh, per state by state or what? So, uh, well, the way that it's going to work is um, after there's a disaster, what we'll do is we will cast um, a net out in kind of um, concentric, you know, circles. You know, we'll start off with the local community and see how many um, nearby would be able to make it. And then if not enough people can fill up the team from that, then we cast it wider and wider. Um, And then sometimes we'll look outside of the area for somebody with um, specific skills. Uh, and so it'll be kind of tailor made to the specific disaster. And we have a database that already does this um, pretty easily and quickly, which is really, really exciting and fun to play with. Yeah, <laughs> like we'll throw, we'll throw out disasters at it and we're like, what if there was a hurricane in North Carolina? You know, <laughs> what you, you know, like, right. So we do these little um, disasters to see what, you know, who would come up, who would be the team leader in that case. At first, it's just going to be um, Samantha Montano and I who are doing team leads. But eventually, we'll be, you know, taking people who we've worked with in the past and, you know, who qualify. So, theoretically, uh, using a, a current disaster as a, a hypothetical scenario for it, uh, Houston, uh, you wouldn't really be able to draw anybody from Houston to assist with the flooding since they're all victims. Uh, so would you be reaching out to other people across Texas? Well, I mean, uh, first we would look into Houston because not necessarily all of them are victims. But um, then we would definitely look at Texas and Louisiana uh, to start probably Oklahoma. 
um, and Arkansas to follow maybe Mississippi. Um, we'd, pr- we'd, we'd pr- try to stay in there and it, it would probably be pretty easy to stay in there. We definitely have enough people, um, throughout that region who would be able to respond. And okay. I can actually come up with like immediately in my mind who the team lead would be other, you know, if it wasn't Samantha Montana and myself. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm pretty familiar with that area considering I was like, well, if more happened tomorrow, you know, the tornado mm-hmm. then what would happen. Yeah. So I've run that one. Okay. And I, I've, run, I've run Katrina as well. And so Louisiana was another one that I did. Nice. And then what kind of, of special resources would you be bringing in from further out? Uh, like what, what types of people would you be looking for for that? Um, well, we have people in the database who have, uh, specific, um, experience with floods, um, and specifically waterborne illnesses. And so that would probably be somebody who we would want, um, along with the team. Uh, outside of that, probably we would, we will be partnering with a, another organization. Um, I can't give the name because uh, it's between several and it would depend on which ones were uh, going out into the field and who needed us and things like that. But we would find out what work they were doing because if it was, you know, the cleanup, then it might be people who were okay with, you know, manual labor and physical labor, which not all, vo- not all of our volunteers are. Um, if it was rebuild, we might take people who had experience with construction um, and different things like that. It would just depend on uh, what their roles would be. And then we could search the database for the types of people who would best suit those roles. Are you focusing on responding during the disaster or in the recovery afterwards? Definitely recovery. And that's why we're a humanist disaster recovery team. Okay. Specifically the recovery. It's after um, evacuation, the t- uh, you know, securing of resources and after they clear paths for um, the outside organizations to come in and after search and rescue is complete, all of those things have to take place uh, beforehand. And then once the local community says, we're ready for volunteers to start coming, that's our cue. Okay. Uh, so once the, the incident commander leaves the area, basically. Um, right. It's yeah. yes. It's once, once, once they're pre- beyond the response phase okay that's that's really cool yeah yeah it's exciting (laughs) (laughs) and it's close it's it's shockingly close and um considering how uh warm it is already this year so that that's you know doesn't bode well for the country but probably there will be something for us to end up taking part in which is sad and terrible but you know we'll get to see what what happens when we do it <laughs> yeah superstorms in the east or fires in the west yeah <laughs> you already got t-shirts and all that made up well we have the design we haven't gotten them made but we have um, a beyond belief network team who's ready to um volunteer the time um as long as we pay for uh the resources and everything to be able to do it so we haven't done that yet but that's actually occurring next month sweet so, yeah i know one of the most important things apparently in disaster recovery is wearing matching t-shirts <laughs> <laughs> oh that's awesome yeah well, you know that that just kind of takes some of the the bite out of religious people saying you know where are the atheists where are the non-believers and all the in all these yeah. disasters yeah. yeah it'll be definitely impossible for them to say it now <laughs> <laughs> We will yes. definitely definitely be visible enough for people to know we're there. Well, you know, not not on the ground, but you know, people will probably be like, "Hooray! Look!" <laughs> <laughs> Are there any specific skill sets or types of people you're you're needing to recruit right now? No, I don't think so. No. Oh, um, that's you know, awesome. Yeah, no, for the most part, you know, a lot a lot of the jobs are going to be things that you don't that don't require a lot of training, you know, um that you can just train once you're there and it, as long as you're um you know, able to uh do the work, then it it won't be difficult work. It's just more or less they need more hands. And so yeah, it's 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 not not a lot of the positions will be skilled positions. Although, um, you know, if we were to partner with a, an organization such as Rebuild Together, sometimes they um, would like people who have construction experience, and so in that case, we would look for that. But you know, a lot of people who have um, volunteered so far have construction experience and things hmm. like that. Very nice. So you're not looking for specific skill sets. Uh, 
if we have listeners that are interested in in uh, volunteering, uh, mm-hmm. what anything to help them figure out if they should apply? Honestly, I would just apply. If you're interested and you think that if there was a disaster and you had the time and availability that you would want to go, I would just apply because then you're in the database. And if we have a spot for you, then we will contact you. And so, and you know, if we don't, then we won't. And then it's not a big deal, but it's just a good idea for anybody who thinks that they might be interested because let's say we, we live in Pacific Northwest, right? Um, We're due for a 9.0 earthquake. If that happened, then we would be reaching out to all of the people here, um, you know, and near here to be able to volunteer to assist in this area. Probably if a 9.0 earthquake hit the Pacific Northwest, we would definitely be reaching out for more than just a few volunteers. And it'd probably be a nationwide kind of ordeal. But um, yeah, yeah, especially considering the Cascadia Fault runs from Northern California to Vancouver Island. Yeah, it does. Yeah. It's terrifying and horrible. <laughs> yeah, and we'd be competing with Asia for international resources because they'd be dealing with the massive tsunami. Yeah, yep, <laughs> yes, exactly. And so, right, well, and that is, you know, so I would just say if you're interested, then just just sign up because once you're in the database, you're in the database. And you can always update your details later if you think, oh my gosh, I moved three years ago and I forgot, blah, you know, or we'll send um, email reminders like, have you had any changes to your information? Please update your file, you know? Um, (laughs) But, you know, otherwise I would just say, if you're interested, definitely just register because um, once a disaster happens, it's from that registered uh, database that we'll be pulling people to and, and contacting them to see if they are available for the positions that they say that they are interested in being involved in. So earlier you were talking about, um, if there was a disaster, you'd be pulling uh, groups like from, you know, concentric circles out. So how would a, a group uh, register? Same process or, or uh, a, a right now groups not, we don't there? have group registration. That's something that we want to um, move towards in the future. Whenever I said uh, small, what I'm talking about is uh, in the database, how okay. they're designated, like it's broken down by you know, city and then state and then region and then FEMA region and then people who are willing to go nationally. And so the database, all I have to select is which kind of bubble I'm searching within. And then it can tell me who's available in that bubble. But right now it's not actually related to groups that they're involved in. It's related to the individual and where they specifically live. Um, But in the future, what we hope to do is to be able to sign up an entire team and, you know, and have that be an option and, you know, have them be able to, you know, do like a training or something with their own organization to prepare in case they ever had something happen. Um, but that's, that's not yet. That's going to be further down the road. I don't know if I can say a year on that, if it's next year or two years from now, but it's definitely a direction that we're talking about heading in and it's definitely where we want to go. Very nice. Yeah. Disaster, uh, response and recovery is, uh, that's huge. Absolutely. It is. It's, it is. And it's a lot of work. It's just shocking amount of work. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> whenever, you know, whenever we got started, I was just like, right, you just get them a shovel and some food and water and they're good. <laughs> you know, <Yeah. laughs> that is not exactly how it works. <laughs> yeah, I had I had some training on that as a, a teenager when I was in, in college with the response part, not the recovery. Yeah, and response, response is much more involved, definitely more involved because, yeah, I, well, it, I took some cert training and I was really, really excited with how much I learned in cert mm-hmm. training, but it's, yeah, that's definitely an avenue that we are so far away from exploring. Um, but we do encourage um, atheist groups to get involved with cert training in their local areas because if something did happen in your backyard and you, you know, have to help your neighbor, um, definitely taking those kinds of courses help you understand how to keep yourself safe and how to effectively um, take part in a response effort. So highly recommend taking CERT training. You know, they're available for free all over the place. So Now, a, would, would it be fair to say the big distinction between the two is duration and intensity? 
since if you're doing direct response, it is usually short duration, high intensity, and recovery is um yes, a lot uh, sort of, that's part of it, definitely. I'd say that um direct response, like uh during the response phase, I'd say that that's the immediate aftermath, like whenever you are trying to immediately take care of the area and it's usually taken um, care of by only the local people. Like it's literally people, you know, survivors mm-hmm. pulling their neighbors out of their houses kind of, yeah. um, or if they can't get them out, then like running off to try to find some trained per- personnel to be in say, Hey, this person is trapped under such and such, you know, um, you know, please, I need help or whatever. So it's, it's definitely um, taken care of by, the local community and the kinds of organizations that are involved in response, such as um, the Red Cross and stuff like that um, are, you know, sanctioned by the government and, you know, it's really involved. And so I'd, I'd say that usually um, the local communities are usually supposed to kind of be able to handle the first 72 hours. Um, And that's what they should plan for. And as an individual with, you know, a major disaster that might occur in your backyard, then you should be looking into how would you be able to sustain yourself and your family for a 70, 72 hour period, you know, if not more, especially for Cascadia where, you know, how long would it take to get enough aid for this many people to this many places after that kind of disaster? So I would definitely look into preparing because it'll be, it'll take time before, um, aid can really arrive. Yeah. 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 When you think around in the country, there's nowhere that's safe from disaster. Yeah, not really. Um, I'd say, <laughs> yeah, I, if I've been looking at it before and I feel like maybe Arizona might be one of the, I know that they have fires, but fires and monsoon flooding. There is monsoon flooding. Yeah. But if you live, I, I think there are little pockets that are kind of safe yeah. in Arizona. <laughs> just there <laughs> you know I'm, I'm sure there are other little pockets around the country but man it's pretty bad yeah there's there's chances for a lot of terrible horrible things <laughs> yeah so many places prone to tornadoes or hurricanes or earthquakes yeah, or have volcanoes east of the in their backyard east of the rockies then you might just get hit by a tornado <laughs> i mean it's it's not that bad as you get to certain areas but there's more of a chance than if you're west of the rockies Mm-hmm. Because you have that Gulf air that mixes with the uh, West Coast, you know, with the jet stream, and then it, you know, turns up a tornado at the end. Yeah, <laughs> yeah like Idaho gets like a tornado a decade. Yeah, I think there was one here. There was like an F zero or mm-hmm. something like that that hit <laughs> um, like maybe five miles from where I currently live. So I just mm. happened <laughs> to be. Uh, I I moved away from the tornadoes to move five miles away from the only tornado ever to hit around here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that was like a, a an overgrown dust devil or something. It was. Yeah, like, I know. It, it was it cute. Might have taken a shingle off of someone's house or something. Yeah, it's not. I don't really consider that even a tornado. <laughs> Oh, it knocked the pine cones off my roof. Thanks, oh, I'm tornado. Very, I'm very disappointed that I have to clean up my backyard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was around 90, 90 or 91. There was one that hit in, in Boise, and it was right in the middle of town. And <laughs> it went like a block down a road and dissipated. Yeah. Yeah, that's, How yeah, I think, no, there's ones in Oklahoma that have like 20 to 30 mile treks, and they're a mile and a half wide. And <laughs> you know. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, the one that hit my house was a mile and a half wide. So, like, Holy crap. Yeah, I can't right? even. I can't even imagine that. Yeah, it's hard to. I I even saw it, and whenever I was looking at it, I was like, "What the hell is that?" <laughs> you know, because <Like, laughs> whenever you watch the movie Twister, you can like see a tornado, or whenever you watch like the news, and they they're showing you from like um. Like a helicopter, it looks like a tornado. But the thing I saw was just a giant black wall of what? I don't know what that is, <laughs> you know? <laughs> mm. Like, I had no idea of gauging what it was. And I really didn't know. Like, I was like, is that a tornado? Or did it, like, dissipate? And now I'm just looking at a really weird-looking rain cloud. <laughs> like, <laughs> no, that's just a mile-and-a-half-wide tornado. And I had only gotten two miles down the road. And so, you know... <laughs> So it's like, 
as a mile and a half wide. And my house was like basically dead center of that mile and a half wide. So like, so three quarters of a mile towards me is the tornado. And then I'm like a mile and a quarter away from that Mm. looking at it. So, right. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So just a wall of man, you can keep that noise. Crap. Yeah. Right. Well, right. I looked at it and I was like, you know, is that in front of my house or behind my house? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, so all of the above. Yeah. Yeah. Holy crap. Yeah. But, but, you know, I mean, so, right. There's disasters everywhere. Whenever I hear about tornadoes here, though, I'm just like, LOL, you guys don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, when I hear about tornadoes in places like Oklahoma, my response is, why the hell would anybody in their right mind live there? Yep. Yeah. You know, I, I used to have nightmares growing up about tornadoes. And so whenever I had made the decision that I was going to move in with my brother in Oklahoma for a short amount of time, I remember like thinking, oh my gosh, I've always had these nightmares about tornadoes. This is a stupid thing to do. <laughs> you know, like who would ever do this? This is totally insane. Why do people live here? And then I moved there and I got hit. <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> <so>. <laughs> well, Tornado Alley has more tornadoes than the rest of the world combined. Yeah. You know, the number, uh, the number one fastest wind speed ever recorded was in more Oklahoma, like on the planet. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. What speed yeah, was that? I know that? Um, it was in the three hundreds. I don't remember it. You can like look it up on uh, yeah, it's definitely wow. Googleable. <laughs> so, almost like getting close to halfway to mock speed. <laughs> right. Yeah. Wow, that's insane. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and and I knew that before I ever moved there. So, well, I didn't know that before I moved there, but I was aware of the fact that they had had two previous F5s in more Oklahoma. And now I'm like, why do people rebuild there? Like <laughs> clearly topography is not in their favor. Something's wrong. Just, you know, once something gets hit, just Memorial field. That's, that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's the solution. Yeah. Build underground. Screw it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's not like Cascadia where you've got 400 years to rebuild. And, you know, Wiping everything out once every 400 years, that gives you a good chance to update infrastructure. Yeah, well, definitely. So, yeah, definitely. What are you but, about? You know, I mean, if everything's getting knocked down every five years, you get a great chance to update infrastructure. <laughs> <laughs> it's too expensive. You don't even have time for it to get old. Well, the exactly. thing is, every, you know, you pay for insurance. And so, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you don't pay for it. Instead, you just like, you're like, well, we get a new house again. And we need <laughs> all new things again okay it says 318 miles an hour Mm. so wow hooray (laughs) now one thing is pretty awesome like where i'm at in boise the most likely major natural disaster would be a yellowstone eruption which would be almost instantaneous death it'd be like five minutes after eruption i would be incinerated yeah i've heard that like that would basically do a lot of damage to the whole planet Yes, that's one of those where you there'd probably be billions who would starve to death. Yeah, yeah. The way I understand it, we're real. I mean, sure, we're due up for an earthquake in this area around Seattle, but I, I the way I understand it, that whole area is just like even more so ready to explode. Actually, Which- no, we're getting scary data that is being thro- blown out of proportion because okay. the the amount of of lava is growing. Because we're getting better measurements. Oh. So it's okay. not that there's okay. more, it's just they can measure more of it. Okay, they're just being able to measure it. All right. Yeah. All right. That's funny. I haven't been paying attention to that one because I, I basically wrote it off as I remember thinking it was too far away to care about. And so Ooh, mm-hmm. <laughs> that, that uh, thing covers like four states. Yeah, I know. I know. Yeah, I mean, granted, yeah. it's on the corner of four states, but uh, th- three states. Is it just the three? It's just three. Okay. Idaho, it's Montana, Montana, and Wyoming. Idaho and uh, Wyoming. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I went to Yellowstone. It's beautiful there. And I remember it kind of having that pit of my stomach, scary feeling of doom. <laughs> Probably just yeah. the smell, the sulfur. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, it was just, I saw a picture and it showed the size of the caldera. And I was like, Jesus. <laughs> yeah. 
One thing that was freaking people out, I think it was last year, was one of the roads was getting so hot it was melting the pavement. Yeah. And so people were like, wow. oh no, it's going to erupt. No, no, it's the whole surface there is very thin. Yeah, it's like that all the time. They have signs yeah. everywhere that's like, don't step off of the path because your body will be burned. Yep. You know? <laughs> It's and, really like they show, you know, like some guy with his leg on fire or something on mm-hmm. signs. <laughs> and just a little bit of a shift, which happens routinely, they have to move things like roads because, yeah, it's you're on the little tiny little islands of coolness surrounded by fire, basically. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. It's pretty awesome. Yeah. <laughs> It is. It's beautiful. It's 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 one of the most unique places I've ever been. So yeah, good for I, man. I haven't been there since I was a little kid, like maybe ten. Oh man, you should go as an adult. It is awesome. Yeah, come see me and then go to Yellowstone. There you go. You guys could plan a trip together. Yeah, uh, we yeah. could stay at, at Lauren's family's cabin. It's, it's near there. Cool. It's in uh, Island Park, which has the distinction of the world's longest main street. <laughs> it's a city that's 22 miles long with like 300 permanent residents. <laughs> right. And they all just built along that one street. It's the highway. Oh. <laughs> so it's like 22 miles of highway is the main street. <laughs> Come on. That's fucking cheating. <laughs> that's cheating. That's totally cheating. Yeah. You're like, uh, yeah. it's just called main street. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. We win. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, like, fuck you. My, my, my main street is I five. Right. I mean, like if uh, yeah. Oklahoma City was to say, yeah, you know, uh, I-35 is now Main Street. Yep. They win. I don't, maybe. maybe. <laughs> I mean, they're pretty. It's one of the largest uh, landmass cities in the country. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. But I don't think you can call an interstate Main Street because you can't have businesses on that. Ah, so maybe 77. They do have, an. Um, they, you know, they, they have highways that go through there. But who who calls a highway Main Street anyway? <laughs> well, every Island small City. Island Park and uh, Island Park. <laughs> every small town, at least in the Western U.S., has a uh, U.S. or state highway that is their Main Street. Hmm. I didn't know that. Mm. Yeah, it's just they don't usually incorporate everything for twenty miles. Uh, Island Park did that <laughs> so they could get some some lodges included and increase the amount of property taxes they could collect. <laughs> that's all it was <laughs> there you go <laughs> yeah we love hearing from our listeners you can email us at contact at atheistnomads.com tweet us at atheistnomads send us a message on our facebook page at facebook.com slash atheistnomads or better yet call us and leave us a message at 541-203-0666 we might even play it on the show you can also help us out by leaving us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcast directory of choice. So what else have you been working on? I remember you went bald, well, quite a few months ago. But yeah, yeah uh, last year I uh, shaved my head for St. Baldrick's. That was a, uh, I had put a little team together. We were called Atheist of Puget Sound and we all shaved our heads and raised money for charity and everything like that. My head raised like just under $2,000. So that was cool. Yeah. Um, And then, you know, I've been working for Foundation Beyond Belief. I've been hosting, um, co-hosting Ask an Atheist usually once a month and sometimes twice a month. Um, And then... Yeah, I've been volunteering with a lot of random, you know, atheist organizations over here. You know, it's really weird in the Pacific Northwest because um, I'm used to Oklahoma atheist, which is like a one consolidated giant group. I mean, it's over a, a landmass area that's probably even bigger than Puget Sound, <laughs> like you know, um, because it includes. I mean, people come out from like three hours away for these kinds of meetups in Oklahoma. Oh, wow. <laughs> you know, you know, because they, right, it's their connection to other atheists. And so it's just one giant consolidated group. I think there's like 2,000 members or something. But, oh, you know, so, you know, they'll have multiple different meetups every day, just in different areas, you know, like, 
if it was here, then on the same calendar, you would see, um, a, you know, a lunch meetup in downtown Seattle, and then you'd have a tennis meetup in the afternoon in Tacoma, and you'd have, you know, an Everett, you'd have blah or whatever going on, but it'd all be on one consolidated calendar. And then, you know, whichever atheist lived in that region or decided they wanted to go to that from a different region would all go. And here it's just like, people are like, we want smaller and smaller. Can we just stop for a second? My kid is like freaking out. Okay. I also wanted to give a little shout for St. Baldrick's because a friend of the show, Robert Ray was one of the participants and for my local atheist group, uh, Bob Garcia was also uh, participating in that. Nice. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I actually yeah, got to was... watch that. <laughs> Did you? Yeah, I was there and I watched it. And I watched what? your head get shaved. That's so <laughs> strange that I don't remember you being there. That's so strange of me. <laughs> uh, I think, well, we met, actually officially met face to face right after your head was shaved. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We all went to um, eat at that bowling alley place. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that was really fun. No, <laughs> uh, what was I talking about a minute ago when I interrupted myself to say, <laughs> I have no idea. Oh, the, the, the groups being all spread out. Right. Ah, oh, uh, uh, aha. And so, okay. Well, and so the thing about Puget Sound is like, it seems like they're trying to make smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller groups rather than putting all things on one calendar. They're like, instead of like having all of Seattle atheists like me together, because, oh my gosh, we don't want to drive that far, like to the other side of town. <laughs> you know, they're like, why don't I just have my own group for my neighborhood? <laughs> you know? And then who knows what they get together to do. And then I don't know. They just, it's tinier and tinier and tinier groups. I'm not really sure which one is better. It just it felt like I was more connected to a lot more people whenever I was in Oklahoma. And here they're just like, oh my gosh, segregate, segregate more. <laughs> you know, so it's, it's very, it's very funny. So what I end up doing is I just join all of them and then I just, drive around, <laughs> you know, cause you know, they might not be willing, but I've, I've driven all the way up to Everett for, you know, volunteering with Robert Ray. And I drove up to a uh, deception pass to volunteer. At oh, some nice. Oh yeah. The, the cleanup up there. Yeah. 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 I went to that, um, again with Robert Ray. He does. He, yeah. He's really good at organizing these volunteer things. And I wish that I was better at that because if then maybe I could convince some people to actually come to Puyallup at some point, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, what you need to do is create a, uh, atheist of Puyallup group. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Yeah, that's 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 a really good solution. That sounds like <laughs> there was actually I met a guy. I met a guy um, uh, a couple of months ago who was like, "I'm gonna unite all the groups," and I was like, "You're awesome." And I don't know. I don't know what became of that. I'm not sure if he anything was did. never heard from again. I I'm, I keep up with him online, but he's now a moderator for the oldest atheist group on Facebook. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? Wow. Yeah. They were like, they were founded as a group in like 2005 on Facebook. Like, I didn't even know there were groups back in 2005. I was on Facebook, but I didn't know how to use it. (laughs) You know, 2005, I was just getting onto MySpace. Nice. (laughs) Facebook hadn't made it to my college. Oh, yeah. Yep. Well, I, I joined Facebook in April of 2005, but yeah, I didn't know how to use it until maybe 2007. <laughs> I, know. I got on occasionally and there was like one comment or on my wall that was like, happy birthday. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. yeah, but with the, the, the groups in, uh, in the Boise area, we've got seven different groups and six of them are still quite active. Uh, but each one has its own different focus, either geographical or, or uh, I guess, flavor. And so it works out really nice having the different groups, but we do have a n- have nice cohesion with the Treasure Valley Coalition of Reason. And so all the groups are cooperating. We have a lot of people that are part of multiple of the groups. And when we're out in the public, we have a unified face. That's good. And so we found a good yeah. balance that works well. And we do have a calendar with everybody's stuff on it. Yeah, that, see, if you were to really go into Oklahoma Atheist and you were to call 
the people who you typically meet together in a certain part of town a group. Like, you could do that, but they don't. <laughs> Hmm. instead it's just that's just part of oklahoma atheists is you you know these are the ones available in your area but here are all the ones not available in your area and then a lot of people take a part in the facebook group you know Mm -hmm. a lot of the time it's really funny because brian my husband he still is a really active participant in the facebook group Uh, you know i mean he lived in oklahoma his entire life and then his wife basically was like well i'm done here <laughs> Me, you know, I was just like, I, I'm over this. Like, it's over. This is the end. Um, and so, you know, we moved out here, and he always wanted to. You know, I didn't force him or anything. We were always talked about coming to the Pacific Northwest, but I, you know, I was basically like, it's pointless to buy a house, you know, out here when we're planning on moving anyway. So this is the end. But he stayed active with Oklahoma atheists. But every now and then he'll get in a spat where he's on the other side of an argument. And they'll be like, your opinion doesn't even count. You live in Seattle. (laughs) And it's mean. I always I always go in and stick up for him. Then I was like, I'm sorry. He lived in Oklahoma his entire life. And then his house got destroyed by a tornado. (laughs) You know, and his wife forced him to move because she has PTSD. (laughs) You know. Well, I I would just go so far as to say that he's not a true Oklahoman, then. Yeah, definitely not. No true Oklahoman. (laughs) (laughs) Well, and what's funny? Well, and he's active on that group, and it's like the only group he's active in at all. Yeah. Oh. And he basically qualifies anyway, because when we go into town, if we go to a meetup, I think you only have to go to like one or something. So hmm. Hmm. he's even considered like an active member. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds a lot more organized than most groups to actually have such a thing as an active member versus not. Yeah. Yeah, they do. Um, you know, they have um, they have elections and they're. You know, they've been contested and and stuff like that, which also doesn't happen in a lot of groups to have contested elections Yeah, um, mm. where people like make campaign videos and stuff like. Right. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And there's like trash talking and stuff that goes on. <laughs> <laughs> you know, factions break out where they're just like, no, the current leader was an evil, horrible human being because he handled this issue improperly or whatever. Yeah, it's it's. It's pretty fun. <laughs> and yet nice. there's still one cohesive organization. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Wow. Right. Right. It's pretty funny that we would say there's factions that broke out, but they're not because they just end up kind of dismantling those after the election. And then they just go back to Oklahoma. Because <laughs> <laughs> I remember there was some group called the Bastards or something. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But, I, you know, I... I I have a memory of the a few people in the the bastards being um, the kind of people who fight for you know hardline free speech, mm. um, which you know instead of protecting like minorities, they're like, no, you're allowed to say anything, no matter how racist. <laughs> you know, it's like, well, sorry, we're trying to have a community here, <laughs> you know, and so right. So things will break out, you know, arguments about sexism and racism and all those things. I think every group gets at least some of those. Yeah. Oklahoma atheists, with how big it is, gets them a lot. <laughs> <laughs> like way more. They have all these gates, you know, like Fallon Gate and I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> like their own little personal water gates. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, uh. <laughs> but it's fun to be a part of something that big, you know, like to be part of an atheist group that's so large that sometimes it can't even handle how large it is. That's different. Like, that's something that I don't typically see in other groups that I'm in. Usually they're like so sparse and not well populated and they don't really have a handle on what they're doing per se so much as they're just like, well, we're atheists and we need community instead of like in Oklahoma atheists. Like I could probably go, I, man, let me go look at their, like what they have going on today. <laughs> you know, I yeah. bet that. we have a, a local, the Kitsap atheists and agnostics and we have over 400 members, but it's pretty much the same 20 people every <laughs> every two weeks when we go out to drink or do a trail cleanup. Are these Facebook group members? Uh, meet up and Facebook. Okay. Cause uh, okay. 
Like I'm I, one of the Facebook group members. Uh huh. I've you never. Have too. Yeah. I might actually be on the, uh, but you know what? I go to Kitsap thing sometimes. I've been out yeah. there. Yeah. I've come. Uh, okay, so I'm looking at Oklahoma Atheist right now. So the next thing is actually Tuesday where they have a lunch meetup. And then that night they have a trivia night. Um, and then the next day they have another lunch meetup. And the next uh, two days from that they have a board game night. And two days after that they have a Sunday brunch. <laughs> you know, hmm. So it's, yeah, it's active. Wow. That just sounds great. <laughs> I know. I know. But right, so I've come out I've come out here thinking all the atheists are out there and like, where are they? <laughs> like, they're all out here, but where are they? Well, I've lived in the Puget Sound for three years and only heard of one of the groups there while I was there, and that was uh, Seattle Atheists. Mm-hmm. And I went to their website and saw membership dues and the way it was worded at the time sounded like you can show up to four events and then you have to pony up. It's like, um, no, no, never bothered until I got to Idaho. Uh, yeah. Well, and you know, I wonder if it's too out here, like it's less needed in some ways. Um, it's hard to tell. It started, to, you know, I've been here for a year and I still don't have any answers, <laughs> you know, um, but I do miss, I do miss Oklahoma in only that respect. That's like the one thing their atheist community is awesome. outside of that which is funny which is funny because i you know i remember i think who was it was it rush limbaugh yeah it was rush limbaugh who said that uh that wolf blitzer had found the only atheist in oklahoma (laughs) but that's not true it's it's got a thriving active community it's probably sparse i mean like probably the 2000 who have joined are like the 2000 people out of all of them who are Mm -hmm. atheists (laughs) Um, yeah, but still, yeah. But yeah, if you, and, you want to build a, a underground house and have a great atheist community, go to Oklahoma. You know, building underground is actually probably pretty difficult in Oklahoma because um, they're made of red clay, which expands and contracts a lot, oh. and will, uh, which is why they don't really have a lot of basements because the houses would just kind of fall in on themselves. <laughs> wow. Right. So not only is God trying to wipe it out, but he's trying to make sure you can't get safe either. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. And we tried to make that Indian territory. Yeah. That was really nice of us. Yeah. What what part of this country can you guys have? Oh, yeah, that one. <laughs> yeah. Oklahoma and South Dakota. Yeah. Two South of the Dakota states nobody pretty. really should live in. Huh? Th- those are two states we should just kind of like ignore and get rid of. <laughs> I, I don't mind um, some of South Dakota. Some of South Dakota is pretty. And then other parts of it is just grass. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and mosquitoes. Grass and mosquitoes. That's all I remember. As far as the eye can see, grass. I'm just going to say, if you have a, a hill that's over 300 feet, that's not a mountain. <laughs> South Dakota. Wow. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Wow. But but back on the, the atheist groups, it, it, there is definitely a thing where the more difficult it, it feels to be an atheist, the stronger the groups are going to be. If life's too easy, then why organize? <laughs> I can come up with a lot of reasons to organize. <laughs> but the motivation think, isn't there. Yeah, I just I don't know if they know what they're missing. It's it's so it's such a it's such a good feeling to be a part of a large group. It is. It's just, it feels good, especially as a parent, you have like these other parents who have like-minded ideas and you get your kids together and, you know, you go and do really interesting things and you can talk about anything you want because you're not afraid of what they might think about it. You know, I don't know. It's really nice. It's really a good experience that I think, um, I think the Pacific Northwest is kind of missing out on, but yeah. So, you know, there, I, I do have ideas and things that I would love to start working on um, in the local community out here because I, there isn't so much of one sometimes, <laughs> um, but it takes time and it's time that I don't have right now while I'm um, still working on editing these trainings. But I feel mm. like over the next year, I'll finally be able to get past, you know, the huge, huge, massive time consuming hurdle 
getting the program developed because once it's developed, then it'll be, you know, it would still take time because growing the program and, you know, you know, reviewing all of the different, you know, debriefings and stuff like that as we go along and continue to grow, you know, that'll take time, but it won't take as much time as this first get it to the point of deployment um, time that it's taken, which is like, I think I've donated like a thousand hours, something like that. Oh, wow. So, yeah. Right. To getting it you know, ready. And so it's a lot, it's been very time consuming, especially, you know, because the vast majority of that was volunteer hours. I, they, they hired me in April, um, you know, but for five hours a week and I typically volunteer more than that per week. So I'm getting paid for five hours a week now though. That was, so that's pretty cool. I like created my own job. Nice. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. Out of thin air, <laughs> um, and a lot of time, but you know, um, <laughs> But yeah, so when, once I get past that, though, I really want to start doing more things in the local community because I have all kinds of ideas. I just need more time. <laughs> if you like this show, consider giving us some financial support. We make it really easy with one time donations or to support us on a per episode monthly or even annual basis using PayPal or Patreon. Find out more at atheistnomads.com. Use the links on the right side of the page. One dollar an episode is all we ask. Please think of the kittens. Between uh, humanist disaster recovery and being a full-time mom, that sounds like yeah, like two or three full-time jobs right there. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. My schedule is always full, but it's fun. It's fun. Yeah. Also, the good thing about being a mom is that I can kind of dictate what we do. Like today, you know, yeah, I was a mom all morning and everything, but we went for a hike on a trail. So, like, that's what I wanted to do. So, <laughs> I still get in all of my, like, I want to do this time. You know, like, if I want to go to a museum or I want to go to this thing or that thing, I can just go wherever I want and just bring this kid along. <laughs> mm-hmm. For the ride, you know, like I've taken him to music festivals and, you know. And if you need a little bit of spare time, you just leave him back and, you know, some cops will find him and give you a call. Yeah, unfortunately, (laughs) I can't do that. (laughs) Unfortunately, yeah, there's no plan B on, yeah, his existence. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, wow. Wow. Wesley, that was terrible. Take care of You know, sometimes you need a break. (laughs) <laughs> yeah <laughs> actually that's, that's this past, this past week my, my my husband um watched him i think more than he ever has possibly because i was preparing to speak at town hall about you know hdr teams um and to prepare for that i'm i'm not i'm not a I'm not a speaker who likes to, I don't do cards and I don't read anything. I memorize my speeches and then I give them, you know, um, you know, I have slides, but more or less, I'm just like tapping a button as I go. Um, and so, right. To prepare to give an hour long presentation, (laughs) you have to be able to say that presentation at least a couple of times and to prepare an hour long presentation that takes a lot of effort and work and time. And so that started to kind of eat in, especially in the last week before I gave the presentation into being a mom. Cause I'm like, my stress levels are through the roof. I can't even handle life. (laughs) (laughs) I was like, you know, I had been exercising, you know, every day and I had been, you know, going to trails every couple of days and I had friendships to maintain and I was on the radio, you know, like I, I basically last week I was just like, I'm done with life. I'm not doing anything. The only commitments that I have in life at all are taking care of my kid whenever I feel like I can sleeping if it's possible and work, (laughs) you know, (laughs) but I got it done. I got it all done. And, uh, you know, my presentation went beautifully. I didn't stumble at all. I did fine on the questions. Everything was fine. Awesome. Um, but all the kudos and credit in the world to my husband for, you know, taking Anders more than he normally would so that I could prepare for that. That was really cool of him. Well, very cool. Yeah, it's it's nice. Although it's probably stressful for him because he's, yeah, he's not mom. 
and he has to deal with not being mom because, you know, kids react differently to not mom. <laughs> Especially when they're, you know, kind of used to mom. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, and he's, what, three now? Yeah, he's three. Yeah. Which means that he's kind of manipulative now. <laughs> oh, fun. <laughs> Great. <laughs> yeah, he's totally manipulative. <laughs> Finally yeah. realizing that words can get him things. Words can get him things, and also negative behaviors might work out. Oh. Like, yeah. It doesn't work for mom, though. That's probably one of the reasons why, like, mom coming and saying no. He mean, he knows that no means no, because mommy has followed through on that a lot. <laughs> 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 Where nice. I'm like, if you do the following thing, you will receive the following punishment. And then he immediately does the thing, and he immediately has the punishment. And the punishments aren't a big deal. It's more or less like, if you don't do X, I'm going to have to take monkey. <laughs> you know? Not the monkey. Right. And he's like, no, don't take monkey. And then he does the thing. And I'm like, okay, it looks like mommy has to hold on to monkey for five minutes. And, you know, and then you can consider whether or not you want to change that behavior. And then I'll give him back. But if you do it again, you're losing monkey. Right. <laughs> and so five minutes later, he gets monkey. He gets his second chance to repeat the behavior properly. Um, and he typically does it. But now, like, if I make any kind of like, if you don't do X, then Y happens. He knows why it's going to happen. <laughs> awesome. And why is never a big deal. It's not like, you know, it's never a huge deal, but he's, he's just, he doesn't like the idea of why at all <laughs> occurring. Cause yeah, it's never pleasant. It's never, it's never a big deal, but it's also not ideal. And like that- sometimes, you know, all I have to say is Anders, if you don't eat your carrots, I'm going to have to count to three. <laughs> <laughs> like that has any oh, meaning wow. whatsoever. And then whenever he's not eating them, I'm like, okay, one. And then you're like, no, no, I'm eating them. I'm eating them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and like, I've never gotten to three. Like, what happens at three? Nobody knows. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> but it's just like a weird random threat. Like, if you don't do X, I'm going to Y. And just the idea of any Y occurring, you know? So. <laughs> from happening do you ever use the term why <laughs> no okay good so you haven't ruined algebra for him no not yet <laughs> we're close though no <laughs> i've ruined counting to three apparently <laughs> yeah that's gonna make uh, kindergarten a lot of fun oh he's fine uh, he can count to like 40 so he's, he's oh fine. okay yeah, so he's a smart kid. he can read uh, a couple of books he can sound out words you know he knows all his letters and phonic sounds and all that fun stuff yeah he's a, he's a smart cookie wow <laughs> yeah so in kindergarten when they're counting to 10 he'll just be bored yeah i know i've set him up for disappointment <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> especially cuz he's going to be an old kindergartner cuz his birthday's in october so oh, no. like they're oh. going to force him to wait almost a you know an extra year like his cousin's six weeks older than him, but gets to start kindergarten a year before he does. Yeah. Yeah. So he's going to be reading. I mean, he's three years old and he can read several books. Um, so by the time kindergarten rolls around and he's almost six, I have no idea what's going to be going on by then. <laughs> uh, oh, no. That's going to be horrible. No, it'll be wow. great. It'll be perfect. I'm, so by that I'm, point, he'll be what? Mastering theoretical physics? Hopefully. String theory? That is what we're going for. Okay. I'm just is there kidding. any chance of just skipping kindergarten? They won't allow that, but I think they allow you to skip first grade, but I've heard that they shouldn't. I've heard that they shouldn't. So I don't know. I don't, I'm, I'm not even trying to think about it because I brought him in. I brought him in a year ago. I brought him into his local school here, the one that he would be going to. And I was like, so I saw that your policy said that he would have to be held back a year. But, you know, he's two and he knows all of his letters already and, you know, all of his phonic sounds. And then they're like, oh, really? And I was like, write a letter. You write a couple, write three letters, write them down. And she wrote like C-L-R or something. He's like, C-L-R. And then she was like, oh, wow. Yeah. (laughs) You know? And she's like, unfortunately, yes, no matter what, he still has to go to kindergarten and he's going to be, you know, he can't go until blah. And I was like, oh, my gosh, you guys are insane. <laughs> oh. oh, well, whatever. Man, yeah. That would be horrible. 
Yeah, that's it's Poor annoying. Nerd. Huh? Poor kiddo. He'll be fine. Damn. He'll be fine. Yeah. Yeah. You know, maybe I'll get him in. Maybe he can test into some kind of program out here or something. I don't know. Well, you guys are kind of fairly short. So, you know, at least we'll have an extra year to grow and not be the tiny kid in class. That's true. You know, I didn't think about that. But, you know, he had an intestinal disease whenever he was a child. And so he um, is kind of short in stature. You know, he's catching up. He used to be way below the growth curve because he didn't grow at all in height or weight for seven months as a baby. And then he had slow growth for six months. So that's like 13 months out of his first 16 months of life where he was not growing or barely growing. So he's really tiny, but he's caught up. He's like 21 percentile now. So yeah, what? That's all. That's all me. I pat myself on the back for that. <laughs> you know? That was a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. And so I, uh, yeah, so you're right though. That, that could be good because if he's, back a grade that he won't be tiny because like now i'm trying to teach him to eat and i'm trying you know i don't i don't i'm positive what i'm doing is wrong i'm positive <laughs> i'm you know you know as a parent you just do wrong things sometimes like you, you know you're like well i'm gonna do this wrong thing i know it's wrong but i'm going to do it <laughs> and this is one of them so something i'll tell him now is like i was like buddy the way that you grow is with food and the way that you get taller and how all kids grow and get taller is by eating. And if you don't eat and if you don't eat enough, you're just not going to grow as fast as other kids are. And that's just what's going to happen, you know? And so I'm just honest with that. I'm not trying to judge him or anything. Like if he ends up small, that's cool. But I have this like in the back of my mind thing that's like, oh man, he's going to be upset later in life if he's not as tall as he hopes he'll be. He'll you be know? upset regardless. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he just might have a little bit of self-hate. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think it's his fault. In the, in the end, I'm going to, you know, definitely teach him that, you know, like, you know, that, doesn't matter what size you are. It doesn't matter what you look like. You know, it just houses who you are, like your brain and your thoughts are who you are. And, you know, what you look like is basically the one of the most least important things. And, you know, and if somebody doesn't it tries to judge him for his height, if he ends up having a height problem at all, you know, <laughs> because maybe he won't. But, you know, if that happens, like I'm mentally preparing as a mom to basically build him up and be like, fuck them. They're fucked up. You know, <laughs> if they think that that has anything to do with who you are, they're assholes. Yeah. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm gearing up to help him deal with a world that acts like a dick about, you know, short males, which is ridiculous. <sighs> yeah. he'll, he'll just be like, I hate algebra. Huh? He'll just be, I hate algebra. That's not <laughs> it. <laughs> <laughs> As a parent, you, you, you go through these scenarios. You're like, how will I protect my kid against X or how will I protect my kid against Y, you know, how will I talk to them about this subject matter and that subject matter and the other subject matter and how other, you know, how they're going to come into these weird thoughts that don't make any sense from other human beings <laughs> <You know? laughs> and navigating a world that sometimes doesn't make any sense. <sighs> Alrighty, All righty. Well, we have passed the one hour mark. Okay. Already, <laughs> um, this was this was a lot of fun. Uh, what do you have to uh, to plug? Yeah, um, I would say check out uh, it, definitely and uh, anyone anyone who thinks that they would want to volunteer, even if you think I'd only volunteer if it was within one hour radius. Hey, if something happens next to you, then you're in that database and you are in the one hour radius, and you can select that you don't want to go past that one hour radius. You can, you can say that and that is perfectly fine. And so I would just suggest to anybody who thinks that they would ever want to volunteer with HDR teams that they will uh, register at foundationbeyondbelief.org slash HDR teams. And I'd also say that um, you should check out uh, ask an atheist at ask an atheist.tv because you can hear me on the radio Um Usually once a month, but it's a weekly radio program, and it's awesome. Awesome. Yeah. 
All right. Well, it's been a real pleasure, and thank you very much for joining us again. Yes, thank you. See you in another 66 episodes or so. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> right, after the launch, right? That's, yep. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep, yep. yep. <laughs> well, once you're done debriefing the first couple teams. That's right. Yeah. Whenever, yeah, yeah, and hopefully haven't run into any problems. <laughs> but if we have, I will enumerate them on your show. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. That'll be fun. <laughs> All, All right. right. So you get a meetup pretty soon. Yeah. Huh? I See. should. I should. Now that I have yeah. a little bit more time. Oh my gosh, my schedule coming up into recently was oh, 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 oh. that's how it felt. <laughs> <laughs> and then for our listeners, uh, our next episode will actually be episode one hundred. It'll be live hangouts on air. And uh, watch Facebook and Twitter for the details. Oh, that's exciting. Oh, yeah. Hey, I, I hope to be a part of that one, too. Hey. <laughs> yeah, 100. That's a, that's a real milestone. Congratulations. All right, thank you. Thank you for listening to another episode of Atheist Nomads. You can find us online at www.atheistnomads.com. Contact us at contact at atheistnomads.com or leave us a voicemail message at 541-203-0666. You can also like us on Facebook or leave us a review on iTunes, Zoom, or wherever else you find the podcast. Until next time, this has been The Atheist Nomads.